Hello, it's Scott Manley here. The big space news this week was on Wednesday when NASA had a press conference which featured acting director Sean Duffy revealing something new about Mars. Now, it has been something of a tradition for every director of NASA to get to have some sort of Mars-based press conference about the discovery of water or the discovery of life. And, well, to be clear, each and every single one of these big discoveries has been very important steps forward. Uh, and I did actually realize I said Mars-based uh, press conference. Obviously, what I'm meaning is that it's a press conference about something that is from Mars or associated with Mars because we haven't quite yet got the human spaceflight program to the point where we can have press conferences from Mars. But I would love that we get there someday. But yes, this particular press conference was about this particular rock and a number of other related rocks, which had been in subject to intense scrutiny since their discovery back in July of 2024. So this particular sample is named Sapphire Canyon, and it's not actually from a canyon, it's from a location called Noretva Vallis, which is basically a river channel that flew, uh, flowed through the rim of a crater, of Jezero Crater. Mars was a whole lot wetter about 3 billion years ago, and in the bottom of this uh, river, the deposits were laid down, and in these deposits, these interesting spots appeared, which were christened poppy seeds and leopard spots. To give you an idea of the scale of this, the largest of those leopard spots are about one millimeter in diameter. The poppy seeds are like standalone, very small spots, but the leopard spots are the ones that really stood out because what you have is a lighter area in the middle, then there's a dark rim, and then on the outside you've got the much redder uh, natural color of the mud or the silt that was laid down. And people that have studied ancient fossils on Earth thought that they saw some resemblance between these and early potential proto-fossils from early life on Earth. And three billion years ago, there was life on Earth. But finding evidence of that is surprisingly difficult. They don't really get fossilized. What you see is the chemical reactions that life is performing leaves an imprint on the mineralogy in these ancient rocks. And that's what set off a whole bunch of intense scrutiny and a year-long review process which led to a paper that was published this week in Nature. That was what the press conference was about. Now, the title of this paper is Redox-Driven Mineral and Organic Associations in Jezero Crater Mars, but the original title of the paper prior to peer review was Detection of a Potential Biosignature by the Perseverance Rover on Mars. And one of the great things in understanding this paper is that the, the paper's been made open access on Nature. And also, we can look and see the peer reviewers' comments, their issues that they had with various parts of the paper, and have the, the authors of the paper try to explain away their understanding, their thought process for why they believe this potentially could be a biosignature, and how they have worked to try to rule out every other possible abiotic, i.e. non-biological, uh, origin. So if you're not a chemist, uh, redox refers to reduction and oxidation, and that's basically the movement of electrons from one atom to another. When hydrogen and oxygen burn to create water, the hydrogen is basically moving its electron over to the oxygen to balance the oxygen's electron shells. So that's the hydrogen losing an electron is being oxidized, the, o the oxygen gaining electrons is being reduced. When you look closely at life, it's chemistry, and when you look, look closely at chemistry, it's electrons being moved from one atom to another, so it's physics, I guess. But I feel I should really stress that I am not much of a chemist, or biologist, or geologist. In fact, when this uh, story came out, I thought, quick, I shall just rush out a video, and that'll be, you know, a bunch of people interested in re watching this. Uh, but then I got asked to go sailing, and I couldn't turn that down, so I kind of was uh, out in the water for a day thinking about this whole problem. I got home, and I was like, well, I have a lot more free time. Let's try to understand this scientific paper that's been published in Nature. And I've been knee-deep in it for the last 24 hours trying to understand all this stuff. It's funny how having more free time sometimes means that things take longer. Anyway, first of all, want to understand the context. This is the map of the area that was being explored. They actually spent a long time in this region called Bright Angel. It was observed from orbit by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's a brighter area, has like meter size exposed chunks of like uh, rock sitting underneath these dunes. 
Now, the Sapphire Canyon sample specifically comes from that region at the top, Shavaya Falls, you know, which also includes Apollo Temple, Steamboat Mountain. But some of these other places that are marked also had similar mineralogical signatures and uh, were included in this study as you know, reference points. So we see all these other locations referenced in the paper where they've taken similar measurements and found mineralogical similarities. The paper also references this cool animation from Pro 3D Space. It's just basically an exploration of the various sites. Now, like when that zoomed in there, you saw what looked like a crater. That is like a crater that's inches wide. It's being created by the abrading tool on the end of the arm. This is basically taking imagery that was captured from orbit and merging in imagery which was covered from the rover, from like the navigation cameras right down to the microscopes are on the robot arm. Here's an example of another abrasion site, Steamboat Mountain. The rover has all these tools that enable it to analyze the rocks, but they have a, an abrasion tool which basically will scrub off the outside and let them see the unweathered surface underneath. What you also see at some of these locations is the debris where the drill went in and took the sample. Remember, one of Perseverance's primary missions is to find really cool bits of rock and then collect those as samples, put them in these, ver these sealed sample tubes, and in some cases they will leave them on the surface of Mars. But in the case of Sapphire Canyon, the sample tube is being stored inside the rover, protecting it, carrying it along like a little buddy on its trek across the surface of Mars. And of course, the idea is that one day the Mars sample return mission will come and take this back to Earth because that's the only way we're really going to answer the question, some of the questions that this uh, sample has raised. But until that happens, we are basically have only the limited amount of information the scientific instruments on Perseverance could bring to bear on this sample. So this is the context of the object. This whole thing is maybe about one meter across. And you see there the Shavaya Falls Sapphire Canyon sample bore there. And this is the close-up of that. Now, these images come from the Watson and Sherlock instruments. So Watson is the wide-angle topographic sensor for operations and engineering. And Sherlock is the scanning habitable environment with Raman and luminescence for organics and chemicals instrument. Both of these are pretty much mounted together on the same segment of the arm. They've had some technical problems with this. Uh, the Sherlock, apparently the focusing system doesn't work anymore, so they have to move the robot arm to exactly the correct focus point, and there's a lot of slop in there because it's a big arm and a very fine focus uh, requirement. And while these images, again, show these uh, poppy seeds and these leopard spots, what is really important here is those graphs in the bottom right corner. So the Sherlock instrument is using Raman spectroscopy. What they're doing is they're basically firing like high energy ultraviolet rays at it. And as the photons get scattered, some of them interact with the molecules in there. They give up some of their energy and they get scattered out with slightly different energy. And the amount of energy that they lose depends upon the molecular bonds that are in play. And so that there along the bottom is the wave number. That's basically measuring how much energy is being lost as these photons are scattered. They've got a relative intensity up the side. And you'll notice the wave number units are in inverse centimeters, centimeters to the power minus one. Complicated story behind that, but what we're basically doing is measuring the energy loss here. And what they've got in those horizontal traces are different places where they looked. And the top three are all showing peaks around 1600. And that is called the, the G band, right? The G band stands for graphite. What they're showing is that there are carbon-carbon bonds in this. And while that might be from graphite in the sample, it's far more likely to be from one of the numerous biological molecules, which uh, carbon is basically the building block of organic life. But there are many, many types of carbon molecules coming from all sorts of sources. What this is basically saying, however, is that there are probably carbon molecules in there. If there was life in here or the remains of life in here, you would see this G-band signal. The other instrument that plays a huge part in this uh, science is PIXEL, that is the planetary instrument for X-ray uh, lithochemistry. This performs X-ray fluorescence where you bombard a target with higher energy X-rays and uh, that causes uh, fluorescence, which depends upon the atomic species that are in the sample. And so using this system, you can basically roll up next to a rock, hold the sensor there and essentially take a picture of the chemical elements that are near the surface. 
And that's what this figure in the top left is all about. The different pixels are showing how they classified different materials and then they sorted these out into different spectra to analyze what materials are where. And they found that there were chemical changes between the outside of those leopard spots through the black line around them and into the center. There were changes that uh, could be translated to different minerals. And they could see the changes in color corresponded to chemical changes. They very specifically looked at two minerals, which on Earth are associated with the biological process. The first is vivianite, which is like an iron phosphate, and uh, the other is grigite, which is an iron sulfide. And notably, in both of these minerals, the iron is at a lower oxidation state. It has been reduced, and that's why the outside of these things was red, because that's your typical iron-3 ion while vivianite and uh, grigite are both the iron-2 ion. But also this pixel data shows that the, uh, the leopard spots are enriched in iron and phosphorus. And phosphorus is very important to life. I mean, the backbone of DNA and RNA requires like a sugar phosphate uh, structure. Uh, phosphorus is really important in cellular metabolism, in cell membranes. Iron, obviously we can think about hemoglobin in the human blood, but even before that existed, life on Earth has been using cytochromes, proteins with iron in them, as part of a metabolism for as long as life has been around, I think. And that graph in the bottom right is interesting because you see the arrow that shows increasing G-band strength. That means more carbon, more potential biological material. The arrow that points in the other direction is increasing iron-3 ions, which means the samples with less of the native, you know, iron-3 ion have more biological, potentially biological material. It's like those molecules that have the carbon in them are somehow reducing the iron. And these are the kind of signatures that if we saw them on Earth, we would presume that these were indications of fossilized life. But on Earth, we find life wherever we look. I mean, we look in radioactive pools of sludge and we find that life has found a way to live there. On Mars, well, we don't know that life's there. We need to rule out every single other possibility. While, while this kind of chemical processing is the kind of thing we expect to see from life on Earth, we need to show that it, no other process could have done this on Mars. And that's one of the reasons why this paper took a long time to gestate. The authors of the paper understood that this kind of processing of iron minerals was possible with high pressure, high temperature, supercritical water. And so one of the things they did was they made sure that there was little chance of that having happened in this sample's history. There's no evidence of volcanism that could have heated these rocks in situ. Uh, there's no evidence that they've been buried deep enough inside Mars to reach the kind of temperatures and pressures needed. And the scientists who reviewed the paper suggested a few other variations and concepts. And they also suggested changing the title to step away from life, your know, biosignature to, you know, redox reactions. And so in the absence of abiotic mechanisms that could work on this rock, the remaining answer is that it could well be life. But really, we'd like to be more certain. So first of all, ways that this could go is that somebody on the ground could get into a lab and come up with some plausible mechanism whereby this processing could happen on Mars, and maybe there's some signature that could be identified. The other more interesting uh, solution is that we get those samples back to Earth. Perseverance has many, many samples that we would like to get back, but perhaps this one uh, is the, the greatest and most interesting. You know, when you bring the sample back, there's all sorts of processes that can be applied to it on Earth. The simplest one, I think, would be just like, let's look at the isotopic ratios of carbon, because uh, life, you know, biological mechanisms tend to modify the isotopic ratios of carbon to carbon-13. We have microscopes and mass spectrometers that are vastly more capable than could ever be put on a spacecraft. Perseverance left all sorts of possible scientific payloads behind on Earth because it wanted to have this sample recovery and caching system. It was going to be the first part of the Mars Sample Return mission. Unfortunately, Mars Sample Return looks like a distant possibility right now. The costs inflated, and as of the end of the month, we're still looking at potentially massive cuts to NASA's science budget. Now, China, of course, they have their sample return mission that they're planning to launch in 2028. Thanks to this work, they now know exactly where they go need to go to get potentially the most interesting samples. And so, during the US press conference, 
It felt very much to me that uh, Sean Duffy was making a point to reference Trump many times because, well, I think that Trump likes things that say nice things about him and is more likely to uh, give money to them. So that's basically Sean doing exactly what a NASA administrator should do. For example, he made sure to mention that Perseverance was launched during the first Trump administration, didn't, for example, mention that it had been commissioned under the Obama administration. And this was also Sean's first press conference like as part of NASA, so it was completely understandable that the first questions, and indeed many of the other questions, would be saying, well, what's going to happen with Mars sample returns since that's the only way that we're going to be able to confirm this uh, particular hypothesis? And so, yeah, he was pretty much non-committal on moving forward with any kind of Mars sample return. And meanwhile, in parallel, the last couple of weeks, I've seen both Blue Origin and Rocket Lab uh, basically advertising their Mars communications orbiter because we do know that that did make it into like a congressional budget. It's not Mars sample return, but it would be an essential part of that program if it were to get funded somehow. SpaceX have, of course, talked about sending uh, their robots to Mars, but I mean... Look, I don't think they're going to be able to beat China to Mars sample return if China's launching in 2028. But it does feel increasingly likely that a Mars sample return will be a much more commercial mission than it was originally designed to be. But now, wait a minute. If we think there's potentially life on Mars, should we be bringing it back to Earth? After all, if you remember War of the Worlds, the Martians came to Earth and then were killed by our bacteria. Well, obviously, the Martians that we'll be bringing to Earth will be the bacteria that there is on Mars. Or at least long-dead bacteria if we're using these leopard spots as our ideal sample. I wouldn't be too concerned about ancient Martian diseases coming to Earth. After all, we have uh, lots of chunks of Martian meteorites that have been coming to Earth throughout history, and those haven't caused any trouble so far. And that does lead me to my sort of final point, that... Uh, you know, this is three, three and a half billion years ago on Mars. Mars was wetter, life could have formed there, and then potentially could have died out as the climate changed. But we also know that asteroids hitting Mars have knocked chunks of Mars off to Earth. It could be that life on Earth actually came from Mars, or it could be that chunks of rock knocked off the Earth took life to Mars. It's really, we're not really clear about the early history of the solar system. We could look, we could find something that has some sort of biological origin and we could find that it is clearly similar to Earth or we could find that it is clearly different. For example, if the handedness of the molecules is opposite, right, that would be a clear example of separate evolution on both planets. And that could imply that there is life basically almost everywhere in the universe. It's just intelligent life that becomes the much rarer thing. Or it could be that once life forms on one planet in a star system, that it gets distributed to others by impact. It could even come from beyond the sun. Even if we got the sample back tomorrow and we answered the question definitively, it could just simply lead to many, many more questions about life and our place in the larger universe. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>